So after going through losing a loved one to Alzheimer's, you are not going to be the same person as you were before. That's just a given. How you are going to be different is a matter of choice. You're either going to be harder or you're going to be softer. You're either going to be more brittle or closed off, uh, angrier, or you're going to be more compassionate, softer, more open, more giving. It's a choice, you know, and it's a choice I think you make every day in going through that experience. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. I'm Marianne Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. Join me each week to listen to one of our authors talk about their dementia journey, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the whole care network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to The Whole Care Network. Hi, this is Roseanne Corcoran, host of Daughterhood, the podcast, and a proud member of All's Authors. I wanted to share some exciting news. All's Authors has a merchandise store. That's right. Now you can buy t-shirts, sweatshirts, caps, bags, and more in various colors and All's Authors logos. You can even customize them for an additional charge. All proceeds from the merchandise store benefit All's Authors, so we can continue our mission of not only sharing the web's most comprehensive collection of books and blogs on Alzheimer's disease and dementia, but also support our podcast, Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, where each author shares their personal journey to help you learn and cope with an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis. You can find the store on allsauthors.com or in the show notes. Thank you, and remember, you are not alone. Patty Davis is an actress, author, activist, advocate, and daughter of a United States president. She has written extensively about her father, Ronald Reagan, and his Alzheimer's disease in both The Long Goodbye and now Floating in the Deep End. In 2011, she created a support group program for caregivers of people with dementia called Beyond Alzheimer's. Floating in the Deep End is an extension of that support group a handbook for those on the perilous and sorrowful journey of losing a loved one to this mysterious disease. It is also part memoir, as many of the memories of her own dementia journey have taken on a different resonance with time and reflection. She hopes that caregivers and readers find guidance and comfort in this book. In this episode, we discuss both the challenges and comforts of living your Alzheimer's journey in full view of the world her approach to building caregiver support groups, and the lessons and gifts that can be found in dementia care. Hi, Patty. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're we're thrilled to have you not only um, come to All's Authors, but to join us on the podcast. I do want to mention that we have Jean Lee here again with us um, in the podcast today. She's the uh, acquisitions editor who brought Patty into All's Authors, and she was dying to come and meet Patty. So now we have three of us here today, which always uh, helps along the uh, discussion, three different points of view. So, Patty, I think that most everybody hearing the podcast knows who you are and knows somewhat about your dementia journey because it was not um, something that was kept private like so many other families. And that's the goal for many families is to try to maintain privacy for the family Mm -hmm. and for their loved one. But for you, that was not possible because your father was such a public figure. Mm -hmm. So can you share with us a little bit about what it was like to have that story told to the world? How did that impact your journey? Well, um, it 
it defined a lot of it. Um, it my father was diagnosed in 1994. Um, he chose to write his now famous letter to basically the world saying that he had Alzheimer's. So overnight, um, the Reagan family kind of became the poster family for Alzheimer's, which in 1994 was a disease that many people had and no one was really talking about. So it was, it, that was sort of an odd juxtaposition. I was living in Manhattan at the time and, and, um, you know, when I would walk around, sometimes people would recognize me, especially right after his letter came out. And, and they would tell me things like, well, you know, my grandmother had this or my parent has it and, and it's really brutal. And, and, you know, they'd tell me snippets of things and then they'd be gone. And I felt like I was in the French underground. I was getting like little bits of information, but, but nobody was giving me the whole story. So I thought, well, I, I'm on my own in this. And, you know, obviously my whole family was on this journey, but um, it's not a secret that we are not exactly a, a close and cohesive family. And by the way, even if a family is close and cohesive, everybody loses that person in their own way. It, it is still ultimately a lonely journey in many ways because me losing my father is different from my brother losing his father. And of course my mother's journey is completely different as his spouse, as his soulmate. So, but it's, you know, it's particularly accentuated if you do come from a, um, a kind of fractured family. So I, I thought, okay, I'm, this is a path I'm on right now. And I was just determined to get it right. I, I felt like I had gotten so many things wrong in my life. It was a very low time, by the way, in my life. I, I wrote about this in, in Floating in the Deep End, that um, I was terribly depressed at the time. Um, ever, everything had gone wrong for me a lot because of decisions that I had made about my life, um, escaping an abusive relationship. I sold my house at the bottom of the market. I lost everything, basically, almost everything. and. Um, I just felt like I'd ruined everything. And I really was at a place where I was thinking I didn't want to go on. I, I just didn't want to go on living. I was tired. I was tired down to my soul. And it's interesting looking back on that now because I, I think, well, my father's diagnosis could easily have been sort of the last nail in, in that coffin, literally. Um, but instead, it, it pulled me out of that because it was something that was bigger than my own despair. It was something that was bigger than my own problems. And I, I, remember, I remember walking up Columbus Avenue um, shortly after his letter came out. And, and I thought, I, whatever this journey is gonna be, I have to get this right. I just am determined to get this right. And I really went to my faith and I, and I thought, God, I, I I don't believe that his soul can have, can be sick. I don't believe his soul can have Alzheimer's. And that became my grounding for what turned out to be a decade of his illness. And it became my grounding much later when I started my support group program beyond Alzheimer's. Wow. That's a very profound thought. I, I read that um, sentiment about soul earlier mm -hmm. today. Um, mm -hmm through the work of another one of our authors who had written about it. Actually, I have it right here. Oh, here it is. I saw it here. She said, the irony, the irony of understanding that all is not lost. Souls shine forth and love endures. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what my grounding was. But I, I want to add also that, um, and I was always very careful in my support group or, or anywhere when I've said to people about, someone's soul can't be sick. Um, I, I'm very conscious of, you know, everyone has a, their own beliefs or lack of. And if someone is atheist or agnostic and they hear something like that, they tend to sort of shut down and go, well, that's not my belief system. I don't care what someone's belief system is. It's none of my business. If, if that does sort of collide with your lack of belief, um, spiritual belief, fine. Consider the possibility just consider the possibility. You don't know that it's not true. And if you just keep that thought in your head that there could be a soul in there that's not sick, it's going to inform how you deal with that person. 
It's going to change how you deal with that person. You won't be, you won't be writing them off. Um, when I was running my support group, I, um, the, the one thing that I would always stop people from saying were, were things like, well, they're just not there anymore. You know, they're just gone. Um, I mean, I was very accepting or tolerant of anything anybody wanted to say, but when they would say that, I would go, okay, whoa, wait a minute. You just wrote off a human being, right? You just, you just said this human being doesn't exist anymore. You don't know that. There's still, there's still emotions there. There's still, there's still a soul there, right? They're still here. They're different and they are losing a lot and you're going to watch them losing a lot. But to just say, well, they're not there anymore. They're gone is, is not only shutting the door on them. It's shutting the door on you and on things that you can learn from this experience and ways that you can grow. Yeah, that's so true. Um, the essence, their essence still exists. Yes. And then, you know, the love between you still exists and your history and your memories, they always exist. And it's more of like the physical manifestation of, of them at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And there is a way and they're discovering more and more, usually through music and art, how to communicate with people and get them to come out again well music is um they they have discovered that music is music i mean in a simplistic term music sort of lives in a different part of the brain mm -hmm. so um dementia patients respond to music usually music that um that they grew up with or that they were fond of in their life you know like if someone i don't know grew up in the 40s and you played them rap music it probably wouldn't work right. <laughs> right? <laughs> if you played them something that they were fond of you know it, um it does work it it um well we you know tony bennett uh who did that very brave 60 minutes piece i mean as soon as he starts singing he's right there he remembers all the lyrics he remembers the the music glenn campbell same thing he could play the banjo, he could play the guitar, he couldn't tell you where his hotel room was. All right. And they kept that up well into the disease. Yeah. yeah. I think the Glenn Campbell farewell tour was only supposed to be about five dates or something. It ended up being mm -hmm. like a hundred and something dates. Yeah. But I mean, it was and, uh, fascinating to watch, you know, that yeah. you could see his confusion, but then he'd start playing and... I was never a huge Glenn Campbell fan. I mean, I knew he was a brilliant songwriter and everything, but he wasn't, he wasn't someone who I listened to a lot. And I, I don't think I appreciated what a brilliant musician he was until I saw that film. And I went, oh my God, this man is, is really good. And he didn't lose any of dementia, didn't take that away. So it's a mysterious disease, but you know, you can't just write off a person. Right. Right. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes to um, the Glenn Campbell documentary because it is very well worth watching, as well yeah. as the Tony Bennett clip from um, his amazing. concert with Lady yeah. Gaga, his farewell yeah. concert, which he yeah. couldn't remember a thing about it the next day. But as soon as he <laughs> was in front of the audience, the curtain opened and, and the, the lights were on. Yeah. yeah, he was like right there. Yeah. He was just, yeah. We were all marveling at that. Yeah. yeah. So that's hopeful. You said that you would meet up with people on the street and they would tell you little tidbits about their life, their, their mm -hmm. dementia journey, and that it was brutal. Did anybody mm -hmm. tell you anything about their journey that gave you any hope? No. <laughs> no, I had to find that in myself. And I kind of kept it to myself for a while, you know, as this progressed um, and a couple of years into into my father's illness, I moved, uh, I, when I came back to California um, because I was flying back and forth to see him. I was just out of money. I mean, I couldn't keep affording to do that. So I, I left New York and I came back to California to be closer to my father. Um, and, I, you know, I, um, I, was, I was very self-conscious about telling anyone how I was charting my journey because I, I, I didn't want anyone to say, you're crazy. You know, that's crazy. And then I had an opportunity 
to start doing lectures. I met a, a lecture agent in, in New York when I was there and he taught me into it. And I remember the first time I, I did a lecture and I thought, you know, as the daughter of someone who, who had Alzheimer's and that's what I was speaking about. And I thought, well, I might as well just talk about this because that's, I have nothing else to say except about what I'm going through. I can't make something up. And if they don't like it, they don't like it. I mean, I'm getting paid for this. So, <laughs> you know, um, if I never do it again, I, you know, I got a paycheck and I, and I learned something here, but as it turned out, I was, I remember so distinctly looking out at the audience as I was talking about, you know, believing that his soul could not have Alzheimer's and, and, you know, waiting for those sort of apertures, those moments when something shown through, shown past the disease. And, and, and I looked at people nodding and that was really the first time that people came up to me and said, I had the same experience. And I realized that nobody was really talking about that with other people because they didn't want to sound crazy either. Right. So we all were kind of keeping it to ourselves. I think there are two camps. They're the camps of the people who are having a very negative experience. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who are seeing the positives. Because I see that a lot in the literature that comes to all authors and when I think we've even had comments from people that, you know, what a rosy picture. And there have been other books in the collection that don't present it that way at all. And I don't want to say anything negative about those books, but they may, there are some stories that come from that point of view where everything was a disaster. And then other people managed to figure it out and, and to continue to find um, joyful moments. Right. But, you know, but let's talk about that for a minute, because I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Alzheimer's or really any kind of dementia, well, with the exception maybe of, of Lewy body and frontotemporal dementia, um, is, is a stripping away of everything to who that person really is, to who that the essence of what the essence of that person is. That can be a good thing or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. With my father, that was a good thing. He was a sweet person. Um, he was a very sweet, gentle person before Alzheimer's and that and stripped away. That was his essence. That is not always the case. I, I have had people say to me, you know, Alzheimer's turned my father into a racist. And I've gone, really? You never saw any indication of that before? Well, you know, there was that time that he used the N-word, but I just thought he didn't know any better. Well, yeah, there was. Alzheimer's does not turn you into a racist. It doesn't turn you into a mean person. It just exposes what was always there. So if your experience of your relative with Alzheimer's or some other version of dementia is that they just become a really cantankerous, awful person, they always were that person. So I understand how your experience of that experience could end up being <laughs> dementia sucks. However, I would say to that person, yes, that's very valid. You have an absolute reason to say this sucks. However, you're not doing yourself any favors by, by only stopping at that, right? That's not, that's not the only color on the palette. You have an opportunity to look at that person and, say, and find sympathy and compassion for them because that's who they chose to be in this life. And now they're stuck there. Now they can't change, right? That's the essential self that they have been composing for their whole life. And maybe they hit it. And because we all develop, you know, um, ways of dealing with the world. We don't let everybody in. We don't expose everything about ourselves. But that's who they were composing all this time. Now they're stuck there. How sad for them. That's your growth in this. And that's a beautiful thing to grow and be able to have compassion for a person who is not a nice person and who you don't even really like, right? Yes, Jean? Um, I just, Patty, I, I've underlined so much in your book and <laughs> I'm going back to a couple of things that you wrote that reinforce exactly what you're saying now. Um, you see, Michelangelo said that when he looked at a block of marble, he believed the shape that wanted to be born from it already existed. David, Pieta, 
Moses were already there. His job as a sculptor was simply to remove the excess marble and reveal the shape hidden within the stone. That's how life is supposed to work. Our loves, our joys, our sorrows, and our losses are meant to reveal us by chipping away at everything that conceals that conceals who we are capable of being so we can emerge the people we were created to be. It just sometimes hurts along the way. And it does. What you're it does. talking about, the core being left there is, is so important. And, and then also along with this, another really powerful thing I think you wrote is something that you alluded to, how a person is stuck there and the panic they must feel you write think about your own fears and panic around discovering that your loved one has dementia and then multiply that by a hundred when you think about how they must feel they've mm-hmm. just been given a death sentence but it's a death by a thousand cuts mm-hmm. and, yeah um they yeah. are traveling down a narrow path a path that you can't follow yeah And, you know, somewhere in that person, even if it's a really unpleasant, nasty person, mean spirited person, somewhere in there is a soul that they lost touch with that, you know, is can't get out now, can't get out past the prison of of who they created themselves to be. And now and now this disease. So so if you stay stuck too and go, well, hell with you, you're just a mean person, then then you're stuck too. So this is your opportunity. You know, listen, I've talked to people whose mother or father uh, got dementia, who had been horrible to them, who'd been abusive to them, sometimes physically abusive. And, and now they have dementia. And, you know, they're going, well, I, I mean, I don't, how can I love them? They, they were never loving to me. Okay, that's totally understandable. No one's asking you to, to, as my friend Marianne Williamson says, pour, pour pink paint over something and go, oh, it's fine, it's fine. No, it's not. They were horrible to you. You didn't have the, get the love that you needed. Now is your opportunity to, uh, to be bigger than that and find a different kind of a compassionate love. Not that you love them as an individual, because how could you? but you love them as a child of God who forgot that they were a child of God, Hmm. right? You remember about them what they forgot about themselves. That's the essence of forgiveness, by the way. So this is your opportunity to learn how to be a forgiving person. And if you can learn it in that situation with a parent who was horrible to you, that's a quantum leap. Then you can learn it with anybody. Yes. That's amazing. I think many, maybe people who are mean and horrible, something happened to them in their past that hurt them and, and sent them that probably, way. Probably. probably. Yeah, probably. I, I don't, I mean, I think that can be interesting to, um, that can be interesting in therapy to kind of touch down on and say, and analytically and go, okay, well, my mother is the way she is because of what happened to her as a child. However, at a certain point in all our lives, we choose how we behave. So there are people who had terrible things happen to them in life. There are Holocaust survivors who, who didn't turn out to be child abusers, right? right. You know, who were good, wonderful people. Um, so that only goes so far, in my opinion. You know, like I said, analytically, it could be interesting for you to go, okay, well, that can be a tool in learning to forgive that person. But ultimately people are responsible for what they do. And if your parent was was horrible to you, you know, growing did not loving to you, how sad for them and and how great for you if you can find the tools in yourself to like I said to um to find compassion for a human being who who chose that path to go down and and kept on going down it. And I think that's what we're called on to do. I remember someone in, in my support group um, saying it's a little more innocuous, but um, I, I think it was a situation where they had hired an outside caregiver 
And then they were like bossing the caregiver around. It's like, well, this is ex exhausting. Now I have more work to do because I have to keep telling the caregiver what to do. And I said, well, either you got the wrong caregiver or you don't want to give up your control thing. I already knew what it was. I knew they had a problem with control. And they said, well, I'm just a controlling person. It's just who I am. And I said, well, there is who we are. And then there's who we're supposed to be. And the two usually don't meet up until we right, make them meet up. I don't think God, when he put you here, went, okay, you, you're going to be really controlling and you're going to be mean and you're going right? to, it doesn't work like that, right? Choose differently. Yeah. That's excellent advice. Now we do have in our community authors who have chosen to, care for a parent with dementia who was not good to them, very abusive. Yeah. Parent. And the opposite happened. They got a new parent and they were able to have a loving relationship at the end. Well, then I would that say that that, that that lovingness was always in there. Because like I said, Alzheimer's doesn't, doesn't create something that wasn't there before. So how, for whatever reason they acted mean, there was that loving person in there and that and things got stripped away that you found that that's unusual, I think, but great. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about three, at least three people, Susan Cushman and Susan Landis and Laura Davis have all went through that. And the Alzheimer's was a gift because they felt because it allowed them to have that relationship that they hadn't had before yeah right yeah i guess you're not going to know what you're going to get no you're not <laughs> and i think that's another lesson in this and it's actually i think another gift um i mean i um i mean i wrote about this one of my sort of mantras was i, I would just i would go i don't know what's going to happen i don't know who my father's going to be when i when i walk in my parents house today I don't know what's going to happen next week. I don't know if he's going to stay on this plateau that he's on for a month or a day. I don't know. Right. So it took me out of that um, thing that we all do of like, okay, well then, you know, in two weeks, this is going to happen. And in a month, this will probably happen. And, you know, we all, we always try to project what we think is going to go down and life doesn't work that way, that way. So you, you have written many books about your life yes. and novels, fiction as well. Yes. Some of them are self-published too, right? A couple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did so publish what, what motivated you to write about this story at, at this time? Uh, well, I, I wrote uh, the long goodbye. Um, I started writing that when my father was diagnosed and published it right after um right after he passed away. And, and that was really um, about what I was going through as I was going through it. In fact, I structured it as a journal. Um, I mean, every entry and every chapter is like dated and stuff. Um, and, you know, a lot of the insights that I have come to now, I were forming then, but, um, you know, I think as with anything in life, you once you get past an experience and you start to see how it how it molded your life and how it changed you um the lessons are sort of um more profound and uh kind of deeper i think um and then and in 2011 i started i created a support group pro program called beyond alzheimer's for caregivers. I ran it for six years, twice a week, first at UCLA and then for a year at St. John's. And for a combination of reasons after six years, I, I needed to step back from running it. And um, I embarked on trying to license it to hospitals. I mean, I wasn't going to let the, you know, I wasn't going to just close up the, the support group program. Um, and two hospitals licensed it, Geisinger in Pennsylvania and Cleveland Clinic in, in Las Vegas. And I got a number of no's um, from hospitals, uh, which sort of 
solidified what I already felt, unfortunately, that I, I don't think the medical community cares enough for caregivers, even though they know that caregiver stress is a very real thing. And caregivers are really very likely to get ill and even die before the person they're caring for because of stress. So um, I thought, okay, fine. If I can't turn Beyond Alzheimer's into the AA of of caregiver support groups <laughs> um, yet, um, then I'm just going to write this book. And so people will have have all of these principles and all, all these ideas and insights at their fingertips. And that's how this book was born. That was great. So it's like having a caregiver support group in a book. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple of, a couple of um, reviewers on Alzheimer's actually said that. Hmm. It's interesting what you said about the hospital facilities, because I worked at a hospital. I actually ran a support group there for a few years, not, not on Alzheimer's, but they had a number of different groups and they happen, happened to have an offsite facility and they moved all of the groups there because they felt that people were sick of going to the hospital, people who were involved in medical situations. And so to come to the hospital, even for a positive thing, like a support group, it was the turn off. So they would have them off site. So they didn't have to go to the hospital. See, I did it. I, my thinking was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be run at a hospital because I, first of all, I wanted the hospital to be accountable for um, caring for the caregivers. Um, and I also wanted people to come into this environment that is, was scary to them or, where they had something found out diagnosis they didn't want to find out and um, and get care, you know? And when I first presented it to David Feinberg, who was uh, running UCLA at the time, who I dedicated floating in the deep end to, um, I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to charge people for this group. So, you know, it's going to cost you something. I mean, I and my, I run it with a, co-facilitator from the medical field. So, you know, we have to get paid for our time, but you're going to make you, the hospital are going to make money back because people are going to see you as a caring institution and switch probably their, their loved ones care here and even their own care. And I mean, that's exactly what happened. I didn't even have to present that to him. He already knew that, but um, you know, it's, that's exactly is exactly what happened. They thought, you know, people thought, well, if, if a hospital cares enough about me to have this group here under its roof, then that's the hospital I want to go to if I need to. That's interesting. It's Cause I went recently, I attended a grief support group at this particular hospital medical center mm -hmm. and they had it again at that offsite building. So. Uh, yeah, I think it, and I mean, the amusing thing for me coming up with that idea is that I'm terrified of hospital. I have the worst white coat phobia right. ever. I mean, if I've had to visit people in hospitals, I have to like, you know, really like stand outside for a minute and go, Patty, do not get lightheaded. Do, you cannot go in there. I feel like you're going to faint. <laughs> <laughs> when I lived in New York, I had a very good friend who had, who had AIDS and he was in and out of the hospital a lot. And, you know, I would go visit him and I would, I go, you have to breathe. You have, you cannot go. And I remember one time him looking at me going, you look a little pale. You should sit down. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, I have that at work a lot. in the hospital bed and I'm like, well, God, I hope I don't faint. <laughs> we have that at my job a lot because I'm a, I'm a nurse and I work in a, at a college um, in the health office and we have nursing students and others in the health professions and there's always some student that faints yeah you know when they see the blood draw or if somebody's in labor or somebody threw up <laughs> we're always getting calls of so and so yeah it, it doesn't even take that for me you have to I deal mean, with I that just, it's just I just have white coat phobia like if I go in a regular yeah. doctor's office you know it, God help them if they take my blood pressure. It's like, wow, your blood pressure. I go, no, it's really not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just nervous. Well, I don't know. I, I think we're led to believe that like a hospital is like a negative place to go because you go there when you're sick or something bad has happened. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
I, t- I mentioned that I had read your book via the audio book, but you did not narrate it. Right. Is that something that you would have wanted to do or did you? you no, they it? just, um, there are people who do that and mm-hmm. they just, you know, they sent me a recording of this, of this woman and mm-hmm. reading something else that she had done. And I said, she sounds great. Yeah, she so, was great. It was great. Yeah. I love listening to audio. I got to plug in the audio books here because, you know, you, you can, if you're a busy person and you don't have time to sit down and stop everything and read a book, you can plug into an audio book and listen as you do something else that yeah. doesn't occupy your mind. And you'd be amazed yeah. at how quickly you can get through something and enjoy it at the same time. And it's great yeah. brain exercise. Yeah. It's great yeah. way to learn, sharpen your listening skills sharpen your focus, get a little me time in. So audio books mm-hmm. are great. Patty's audio book is great. So pick one up. I'd love to make a, a comment. on Patty, I, I love, love the way that you reflected on your youth in this book. And you reflected on your time with your dad when you were little mm-hmm. and that those principles that you gained from him in those times really led you through the whole journey of believing that his soul remained intact and you still mm-hmm. had that connection together. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's intriguing the way you titled the book floating in the deep end. And I loved at the very end of your book, actually, I want to start at the end when you kind of explain that title that takes you back to your youth. And you say, I ended up floating in the deep waters as he moved farther and farther away. Memories, regrets, hopes drifted around me, but it was the faith he had instilled in me that kept me from sinking the people who live in our hearts never leave, even when they move on, even when they die. Yeah. I just thought that was so beautiful, the way you went back to your childhood. I think all of us who are the child of someone that we're caring for, a parent with Alzheimer's and dementia, we we go back and replay our lives and the things that They taught us whether those impacted us positively or negatively. We feel as though we didn't get enough from our parent. We reflect on all of that and it creates the person we become. And you talk about how this experience of coming up to be the best caregiver you could for your dad really strengthened and formed your life in a way that you felt might not have happened without this experience. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I've, I've always said to people that you are never going to be the same person as you, after all, after going through losing a loved one to Alzheimer's, you are not going to be the same person as you were before. That's just a given how you are going to be different is a matter of choice. You're either going to be harder or you're going to be softer. You're either going to be more brittle more closed off, uh, angrier, or you're going to be more compassionate, softer, more open, more giving. It, it's a choice, you know, and it's a choice I think you make every day in going through that experience. So I think it can, it's an experience that can change you in, in ways that nothing else can. You chose to search for the silver linings in this, to carry the mm-hmm. good nuggets of what happened with mm-hmm. you instead of dwell on the negativity to bring right. you down, you decided to focus on the positive. And because of that, through this book and your others, you've done so much positive work for others who are in the midst of this journey now. I hope so. I mean, that's my prayer. I hope so. I really do. And it's not, you know, I, it is not my basic nature, by the way to be a positive person. Anybody who knows me will tell you that, you know, I have like a real disaster mentality, you know? Um, but uh, I mean, that's like the first thing I go to is like, oh my God, that's it, you know, um, it's gonna be horrible or whatever. 
Um, wow. But I, I chose, like, as I said, I chose to not do that. And I chose on a daily basis to not do that with this disease, which doesn't mean that I ignored everything that was sad and everything that I was losing. And um, I mean, I write a lot about grief and the necessity for going through grief um, while you are going through this experience in, in this book. Um, so I, this was not about um, any kind of denial, but it, it was about taking it and, and gleaning from this experience. What, what can, how can I grow from this? What can I learn from this? You know, one of the lectures that I did um, ended up being right after 9-11, when you do lectures, you, you probably know this, it's scheduled months and months in advance. So I was scheduled to do a lecture. I want to say it was like in Minnesota or someplace like that. It was like, it, it was in a, like a shopping mall, I think, is my memory that there was some area of a shopping mall. Um, and <clears throat> it was shortly after nine. So 9-11 happened, planes stopped. And I have to tell you, I was praying they wouldn't start flying again by the time my lecture date came up, which was like, I think two weeks or something. Um, Cause I didn't want to get on the plane and they started flying right before that date. So I, literally when I left LAX, um, there were no military people at the airport. And when I came back, there were, it was that close. Right. And I, um, so on the plane going, I thought, God, what you know, I can't just talk only about what I've been talking. I mean, I have to say something about what we're all going through. And I don't know how I'm gonna tie these things together. And what I ended up saying in that lecture was that we all tend to say, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to my loved one? Why did they get Alzheimer's? You know, they were a nice person. The person down the street turns the hose on kids if they get on the, his lawn or something. Why didn't he get Alzheimer's? You know, he's really nasty. Um, and the same as what we're all going through as a result of 9-11. Why did those people die? Why did some people stop for their dry cleaning and live as a result of that? Or at the last minute, take a day off and and live because of that? How did some people get out and some people did? It, and you were never, it's natural to ask why, but you're never gonna get an answer to that question. Not on this side of things anyway, maybe ultimately we will all understand everything, but it, a better question is to ask, what can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? I don't know why my father got Alzheimer's and somebody else didn't. I mean, no one's ever going to understand that. So instead, I, I asked, what can I learn from this? I, I encourage everyone to read your book. You make such beautiful word comparisons in your writing um, that just make things so understandable and concrete for someone who's going through this. You write about grief and its beauty. Mm -hmm. you, you write this is what time eventually does with grief. It peels back the sadness, the ache, and leaves us remembering moments of beauty. The sorrow remains, but it's one layer of a more complete experience. Mm -hmm. It's beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Inspiring. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, what do you wish you knew at the beginning of your journey that you didn't find out until later? Boy, I don't know, because I, I really was, um, I really was just going with the unfoldment of, of the experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I don't know that there was any revelation in particular where, where I, I went, oh, I wish I knew that sooner I, I was content to um you know sort of put one foot in front of the other and and learn as i as i went along and i think i i did that yeah you you were very open to the whole experience and many people are 
they're close to it and they're in denial. Yes. Well, denial is the first stage of grief. So that's, you know, that's natural. Um, Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, I've had people say, well, I think I can get them better. I'm going to feed them coconut oil or whatever, you know, (laughs) they start shoving coconut oil down and they wonder why their loved one's throwing up (laughs) because they're giving them too much coconut oil, maybe. Yeah. Well, we have one of our authors um, coming up on the podcast soon who was caring for his wife and he had heard on the radio or TV from the Alzheimer's Association that the person who would survive, the first survivor of Alzheimer's is currently living. So he was determined it was going to be his wife. And then he finally had to accept that. No, that would not be the case. You know, and it was devastating for him to realize, you know, this is a terminal illness. Yeah. And uh, right now, anyway, it's you're not going to be able to save your loved one most likely. Yeah. I think you're, you know, you're putting stress on them and you're putting stress on yourself um, by, by going down that road. I understand it. I I completely understand it, but um, you know, it's, I think acceptance is a really necessary thing sometimes. And this is one of those occasions. You know, if it were a cancer diagnosis, I would say, yeah, go for it. I mean, go, right. you know, miracles happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this situation, I think I think the, the miracle has to be your acceptance of it and your handling of it, how you handle it. That's where the miracles are going to are going to unfold. And those are the choices that you make on your journey as to how difficult it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Are you able to read us something from your book? I know Jean already has, but do you, do you want, to, did you want to, or? It's such a beautiful book, Patty. It's Thank you. I loved it. It's so relatable. You know, I mean, it, it's just, you speak of a common experience that anyone who's going through it, which there are many of us, you know, can, can relate to exactly what you're saying. And, yeah, it's just beautiful. Well, okay, so here's a paragraph. I just like words like service. Well, I'll read this paragraph. If you don't like this one, I'll find another one. Nice. Um, I often listened from the distance of the dining room to the silence coming from the hallway that led to my father's room. I knew he was there. If I listened hard, I could sometimes hear the nurse's soft voice encouraging him to eat but mostly it was quiet. I told myself to make friends with that silence because one day only silence would rest between the walls of that room and trail down the hall. One day he would be gone and I would again have to hold tightly to my faith and believe that no one is ever really gone. They're just in another place. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. I That's kind of how I am about my lost loved ones, they're in another place. I just haven't seen them in a long time. Yeah. I did want to ask you though, um, most of our followers, our authors have lived quiet lives out of the spotlight. Um, and your family, I mean, but you were in the spotlight for decades. Mm-hmm. And that must have just affected you so profoundly. So how was it writing about such a famous parent? And, and you know, I, I think about, um, you know, you, you're just doing your business. You're flipping through the channels. All of a sudden, there's your father. I yeah. mean, how, how does that affect you, like, to be confronted like, like that at any time? I mean, they're talking about him all the time now. Well, I don't know anything different. Mm-hmm. I mean, I grew up with my father on television every week on GE Theater. In fact, my parents used to tell a story when I was just a toddler that my father was on television and I was waving at him. And of course, he wasn't waving back at me. And I was very upset because I could see me him. And they had to try to explain to me that he was on television and he couldn't see me which is sort of a tough concept for a toddler to get when they like there, but there he is, but I'm seeing him and I'm waving, waving. He's not waving back to me. Um, So I don't know. I, it's all I've ever known. 
I don't know what life would be like not not in the public eye to one degree or another. I mean, you know, you know what's what's familiar to you. So it's not something that you really end up analyzing that much. So yeah, you know, turning on CNN and seeing an image of my father or something like that is like, well, yeah, okay, there he is. Wonder what they're saying about him now. I get upset when like, you know, Facebook shows me a memory from five years ago with my brother (laughs) passed away and like, I'm not expecting it. I'm just like turning on my phone and then there's my brother's face. Yeah. But I'm not thinking of him now and I don't want to be reminded that he's, that I lost him. You know, I just find it to be so, um, it's traumatizing, I think, you know, and he's, nobody knows a handful of people in the world knew of his existence. (laughs) Yeah. And Jean, you were like so private about your parents. I was, and I, I, yeah, I was uh, thinking of that in contrast to you, Patty, and the fact that your life was always lived in the public eye, and none of this could be kept quiet. Um, and myself, you know, my parents were both diagnosed on the same day. We lived in a very wow. small town. Um, they were business people, everyone knew them. And I was a teacher in that same local community. And I, I kept it so private, because I felt as though it was their healthcare privacy, and I had no, no right to reveal it. Mm -hmm. And there were, because we were such a small community, a lot of our teachers came from other places. Mm -hmm. And it was only less than a handful of them that I ever revealed that my parents, you know, were struggling. And the only reason I revealed it to those people was they had recently lost a parent and I suspected it was from Alzheimer's. And we became this very small little support group to one another. Mm -hmm. And it, it was so hard for me to reveal to their friends at church that they had this diagnosis or um, because living in such a small community, I think everybody thought, how could you say those things about your parents? You know, they're for Mm. for 20 minutes, they could be fine in a social setting. Yeah. So it was after my mom had died that I realized, okay, this journey could help someone else. And I, because I had been so very quiet about it prior to that and um, guilt filled in Mm -hmm. because I'd been so private revealing it filled me with a lot of guilt, you know, like how would people, I I kept expecting review to lash me. Like, how could you say these things? Yeah. But people, you know, people are, are generally really understanding you know, that's what I saw. I found with that friend. out. Yeah. You know, through this community, um, I found that out through all yeah. the authors. Yeah, they, they are. And it's, um, I, I, I think it's better to tell people, you know, what's going on with someone because otherwise they, they tend to, they notice that something's going on and they think, well, I, I they started doing drugs. Are they drunk? What's yeah. going on? You know? Yeah. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you're honest, you say, no, this is the diagnosis that, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Now I understand. Yes. Right? I mm-hmm. think that that um, just the formation of this community of all authors has helped so many of us come to terms mm-hmm. with that. That and your book is yet another evidence that none of us are alone. Yeah. In this, we all yeah. share common experience with different different details, but we all share a common experience. Yeah. Yeah. So where can people find your book, Patty? Uh, Everywhere. uh, You know, um, everywhere. Amazon, everywhere. Okay. And it'll be in the All's Authors Bookstore. Great. Mm -hmm. And where can people find you on social media or on the internet? Um, I have an author Facebook page, Books by Patty Davis. Um, mm-hmm. That's also my uh, website, is mm-hmm. Books by Patty Davis. And um, I'm on Twitter. Not a lot, but I am on Twitter. 
Okay, that's great. Is there anything else you would like to tell the listeners? No, I can't think of anything. <laughs> Cover it at all. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, it was lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you, Patty. Thanks for honoring us. Sure, thank you. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alls Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to it on whichever platform you use to listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on Alls Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore where you will find hundreds of carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. We are a 501c3 charitable organization, totally reliant on donations to do what we do. If our author's stories move you, please consider contributing to our cause. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony.